Bible in the last chapter, Revelation chapter number 22. Now, before I preach anything, let me make a disclaimer. Uh, if anything I say is different than what the pastor preaches or teaches, I'm wrong and he is right. Revelation 22, look at verse number 16. Revelation chapter 22, verse number 16. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, verse number 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offerings of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for Tonight, Lord, I pray that you'll give me the words to say, Lord, and I pray that your people will be edified and uh, give us a hearts to understand and ears to hear. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now the title of the sermon tonight is called The Intertestament Period. The Intertestament Period. Now, to understand the Intertestament Period, we have to define the term. Uh, now, the, the definition of the so-called Intertestament Period is this. It's the time between the last writings of the Old Testament and the appearance of Christ. It's known as the intertestamental or between the testament period. It lasts from the prophet Malachi's time around 400 B.C. to the preaching to, of John the Baptist. Because there was no prophetic word from God during this time, some refer to it as the 400 years of silence. Now this is what I, what I, what I talk about as the intertestament period. Now, in order to understand that, we have to understand the overview of the whole Bible. We, we, have to, we need to understand, uh, you know, in general, what the Bible is talking about. So tonight, I'm going to give you a super lengthy introduction. I'm going to give you the overview of the whole Bible, and then I'm going to draw several points in the end. Now, it's great to get an overview of the entire Bible because sometimes we read, say, a verse or a chapter, but we're taking it out of the context, right? Sometimes we can take a verse out of the context of the chapter. Sometimes we can take a chapter out of the context of the book. Sometimes we have to interpret a passage based on the entire context of the Bible. And the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You know, it will be a shame that if, you, if, you, if you've been saved for years after years, but you, you haven't read the Bible for even one time. It's great to have an overview idea of the entire Bible. In fact, my personal opinion is you shouldn't even be studying in depth the Bible unless you've read your Bible cover to cover one time or at least known the overall message of the entire Bible to get the general context. Now, turn if you would to the table of content. The table of content. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you the overview, a survey of the entire Bible to help you understand what I mean by the intertestament period. The Bible says, for I, have, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. A lot of people have not read the Bible cover to cover even one time, even though they've been saved years after years. Some people I know, they only read, read the book of Psalm, the book of Proverbs, the book of Genesis, yet they've never read the whole counsel of of God. Now, if you go to the table of content, the Bible is actually divided into different sections. In the Old Testament, we have the first five books of the Bible known as the Torah, right? The Torah, the Pentateuch, also known as the Law or the Book of Moses. Now, the book of Genesis, uh, it starts with the story of the creation, you know, and the Bible is very clear. You know, everything is being created in six literal days. Because the Bible constantly says the evening and the morning were the first day, second day, so on and so forth. In the book of Exodus, the Bible describing for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that, is in, all that in them is and rested the seventh day. 
Now, some people who believe in the theological evolution, they will claim we're still living in the seventh day. But the Bible says God rested, past tense, the seventh day. So the Bible is clear. The earth is created in six little days, and God rested the seventh day. So the book of Genesis kicked off with the creation story, and then we have the fall of man. We know that Satan deceived Eve, uh, and, then, and then sin has entered into mankind. Go if we go to Genesis chapter number 3. Genesis chapter number 3. So we have the creation story, and we have the fall of man. Genesis chapter 3, look at verse number 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. The Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee, talking about the serpent, the devil, and the woman, and between thy seed, talking about the, the, the child of the devil, and her seed, I believe he's prophesying about the Lord Jesus Christ, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, I don't have time to delve into the prophecy of this passage, but basically from the very first book of the Bible, the redemptive plan of Jesus Christ has already been prophesied in the third chapter of the Bible talking about the seed of Satan versus the seed of the woman. Ultimately, it's talking to the Lord Jesus Christ going to crush Satan's heel, and then the Lord Jesus Christ's head, heel will be bruised. I believe he's talking about the crucifixion. So on the very first book of the Bible, it's already talking about the redemption plan by the Lord Jesus Christ. And, I, and after that, we have the story of King killed Abel, and we have Lamech killed two men. We have the first murder, if you will, enter into the story, and the earth is full of violence. And because of that, you know, God told Noah to build the ark. God told Noah to build the ark, so we have Noah and his wife, and we have Noah's three sons and their wife. We have eight people in the, in the ark, and God caused a flood, a uh, water, everything, killed every human being, killed most of the animals, so saved Noah uh, and and his sons and wives, we have eight people. And after they came out of the ark, God told them to replenish the earth. Go if you would to Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter number 11. So after a period of time, after they've replenished the earth, we have, we have the story of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. Go to Genesis chapter 11. Look at verse number 1. Genesis 11, verse number 1. The Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So the context of the story is we have all these people who in one place having one language, and they want to be God, right? They want to build a tower, reach up to heaven. This is known as the Tower of Babel. I believe this is the first mention of the one world government because the Babylon derived from the word Babel. This is the first, uh, I believe, the first instance of people trying to do the one world government, trying to play God, trying to reach up to heaven. And what, and what God did is God confounded their language. The Bible says in verse number 7, Go to, let us go down, and there con confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So God scatter them, confound their language. I believe that's the start of nations. That's the start of different languages. That's the start of these things. So the book of Genesis takes you from the creation, the fall of man, the Noah's Ark, and the Tower of Babel. And then the rest of the book of Genesis take you, uh, it, it kind of explains how the nation of Israel is formed. We see in chapter number 12, we have the very famous Abrahamic covenant. Let, let's take a look at it. Genesis chapter 12, look at verse number 2. Here is God speaking to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2. The Bible says, And I will make of thee, talking about Abraham, a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now this is what we, what we know as the Abrahamic covenant. Now, the problem is a lot of people, you know, just taking that out of context, but we have to understand this promise in light of the Bible. You know, the Bible actually defines this covenant, covenant in the book of Galatians chapter 3, verse number 8. 
The Bible says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So the book of Galatians explains what this covenant means in the book of Genesis. The Bible says, How can uh, all families of this earth, the, the, the earth be blessed? It's through the gospel, right? And the purpose of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament is for them to preach the gospel to all nations to be a blessing, okay? Now, now, now in other phrases, you know, the Bible also referring to God will bless Abraham's seed, right? Abraham's seed. Now, the Bible also explains what that means in the book of Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. The Bible says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The Bible says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the ultimate culmination of the seed of Abraham is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we who are in Christ is partake of this promise, and we are blessed if we are saved. So the Abrahamic covenant, we have to interpret that in light of the whole Bible because the Galatians literally define that as how shall all nations be blessed. It's because the Lord has preached the gospel unto Abraham. That debunks the teaching of dispensational salvation that teaches in the Old Testament uh, the people are saved by works, okay? So the rest of Genesis, it just tells you a story of how the nation of Israel was formed. It takes from Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. Jacob was later known as Israel, and Israel has 12 sons and become 12 tribes of Israel, okay? And then there's a famine, and then they go to Egypt. There you go, the book of Genesis. Now, in Exodus, by the way, this is a brief overview, okay? I'm not going into deep. I'm just telling you a big picture. Otherwise, we'll be here till midnight, all right? So the book of Exodus, you know, we have the children of Israel from 70 people to a multitude of people, right? And then there was a new pharaoh, a new king who knew not Joseph. So there, there was a lot of afflictions, persecutions upon the children of Israel. So God sent Moses and Aaron to deliver those out of uh, Egypt. So, so the, basically the book of Exodus tells you the story of how the children of Israel, um, you know, how they came out of Egypt. And we have the story of the Red Sea, we have the story of the Ten Plagues, and then we have the story of the Ten Commandments. And, you know, and the rest of the chapter pretty much just tells you more about the laws of God and then the building of the tabernacle. A lot of descriptions on how the tabernacle is being built. Now the book of Leviticus gives you more laws. The book of Leviticus does not really advance to the story, but it gives you more laws to tell you uh, different types of offerings in the first chapters of the Bible, talking about the burnt offerings, peace offerings, wave offerings, heave, heave offerings. And, and they all picture the Lord Jesus Christ as the burnt offerings. And we have the story of Nadab and Abihu. We have, you know, the story of how you can tell someone is being a leper. We, have, we know how to tell clean and unclean animals. And then we have the book of Numbers. Now, the book of Numbers kind of pick up the story from the book of Exodus. It basically describes the story of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, go if you would to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 14, verse number 31. Numbers 14, verse 31. The Bible says, But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Now, the context of the story is we have the generation of the children of Israel. You know, they've complained, they've murmured, and they disobeyed against God, and they've given into idolatry. So God told them, anybody from 20 years or older will die, will wander in the wilderness, save those people who are the little ones, okay? So basically, basically the book of Numbers tells you the story of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. And then we have the last book of Torah, the book of Deuteronomy. Now, the book of Deuteronomy, 
it, it just means second law because deuter is second and nomos is a suffix for law. We have the word autonomous, self-governing, right? So the book of Deuteronomy later means the second law. It's basically a recap of the law. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. There's water here. Thank God. Deuteronomy 32. Now, what's interesting in the book of Deuteronomy is this is the, this is the book where, where the word hell is mentioned the first time. Now, every time, you know, I do believe in the law of first mention, but, but I do not believe in uh, we should necessarily draw a doctrine from it because obviously we should compare scripture with scripture. But usually when the first word is mentioned, the Bible usually gives you some details about that word. And what is important to know where hell is first mentioned in the Bible is, in, in, in a lot of the modern translations, the word hell was not mentioned until the New Testament. They've removed all the mentions of hell in the Old Testament. So it's important to, to, to understand what the Bible describing hell in the, um, uh, in the Bible. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 22. Deuteronomy 32, verse 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So the Bible gives you a lot of, a lot of description on hell in that just one verse, the first mention of the word hell. First, we know hell is associated with fire. A lot of false preachers will tell you hell is not very far, it's not fire, you know, it's just simply the absence from God. There's no torture, it's it just simply the absence, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says hell is fire, right? Hell is fire, fire, and the Bible also says uh, set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Now, I believe hell now is in the center of the earth, the heart of the earth. But after the great white throne judgment, the dead and hell will, will, will be cast into the lake of fire, which is known as the second death. So the book of Deuteronomy carries a recap of the law and it tells the story at the end that Moses died right before they went into the promised land. So here's the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. And then we move on to a section called the historical book, the historical book. It starts off with the book of Joshua. Go to Joshua chapter 11. Joshua chapter 11. So after Moses died, Joshua took the mantle. Joshua took his place, and they finally got to the promised land. But, but here's a problem. The promised land, they were inhabited by the heathen nations. All right? So basically, God gave them the land. Now, kill them all, basically. Wipe, wipe them off. So God told the children of Israel to, uh, to destroy the inhabitants of the land because they are a wicked nation. There are abominations uh, filling the land. Joshua chapter 11, look at verse 21. Joshua 11, verse 21, the Bible says, And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel, Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of, of the children of Israel. Don't miss this. Only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod, there remained. So God told them to wipe them up, to destroy them utterly multiple times, yet they've left a remnant which later they were a thorn in the children of Israel's eyes. So the book of Joshua kind of takes you the story of they got into the promised land and there, there were a series of battles uh, while they are trying to destroy the heathen nations in the land. And then we have the book of Judges. Now the book of Judges is while they are in the promised land, God told them to make no league with the inhabitants of the land, but they have not obeyed God and they became thorns in their eyes. So Joshua died, the Bible describing there arose another generation which knew not the Lord. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. So they were ruled by the judges like Othniel, Deborah, uh, Samson, Gibeon. We have a lot of famous stories about these people. But the book of Judges kind of give you a downward sin cycle, okay? So uh, we call it the sin, servitude, supplication, salvation cycle. Because they've disobeyed God, they've sinned. And because they've sinned, God has brought them bondage. God has brought them servitude. God used the heathen nations to punish them. They have the servitude. 
And then they cry out unto God for help, and then God provides salvation. God sends them a judge to deliver them. But what's interesting is every time there's a, there's a great judge, they did right in the eyes of the Lord. But every time the judge died, they fall back again into sin, into bondage. So the book of Judges was dealing with a downward spiral, the sin cycle. The Bible says in the last chapter of the book of Judges that every man did that which is right in his own eyes. And then we have the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth took place during the time of Judges. It tells you the story of a beautiful picture of the kinsman redeemer, how pictures how God is going to redeem us. And then we move on to a section, the first, second book, the first, second Samuel, first, second Kings, and first, second Chronicle. Uh, go to uh, first Samuel chapter number eight. First Samuel chapter number eight. Now, 1 Samuel continued the story with the end of the time of the judges. I believe it starts with the last of the judges, Eli. Well, the problem with Eli is Eli is a soft person. The Bible says Eli's sons are the sons of Belial. They're sons of the devil, okay? And then we have the person named Samuel. Samuel is a great guy, but the Bible says his sons ruined a site after Lucre took bribes and perverted judgment. So Eli and Samuel, you know, they all have children problem. They all have child problem, okay? So, so the children of Israel, you know, they want a king, but, but obviously, you know, the Lord should be their king. So look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 19. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 19, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 19, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us, and fight our battles. So the children of Israel, they don't listen to Samuel, they, don't listen, they, they do not listen to God, they still want a king, and God gave them the desire of their own heart. So, so God picked King Saul. So the book of 1 Samuel take you from the beginning of the reign of King Saul to the death of King Saul for 40 years. Now we have the book of 2 Samuel. This book of 2 Samuel, uh, it basically tells the story of the second king of the nation of Israel, the King David. Again, he ruled 40 years. It tells you the story uh, from the beginning to the end of his reign. Now the book of 1 Kings, it starts with the death of King David. And then King Solomon, David's son, took his mantle. But King Solomon has a women problem. The Bible says he has 700 wives and 300 concubines, and most of them are from a heathen nation. The Bible describing, and his wives turned away his heart. And then we start the downfall of the nation of Israel. Okay, After Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took his place, but there's also a guy named Jeroboam. So Jeroboam decided to split off from him because... I don't want to go into too much detail uh, because there are all kind of family problems before that. So Rehoboam is taking control of the southern kingdom, okay, the southern kingdom of Judah. And Jeroboam was taking control of the northern kingdom of Israel. So we had the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, and the southern kingdom mainly composed of Judah and ben Benjamin. There are also Levites, okay, uh, Judah, Benjamin, and Levites in the southern kingdom, and the rest of the tribes are in the northern kingdom. Now, in the book of 1 Kings, uh, we have, obviously, prophet Elijah. There's a lot of miracles there. And then we have the book of 2 Kings. Now, the 2 Kings kind of continue with the kings of Judah and kings of Israel. There are good kings and bad kings. Now, in the northern kingdom of Israel, there's no good kings. In the southern kingdom of Judah, we, some, we have all these good kings, bad kings, like Josiah, Uzziah, all these uh, you know, good kings. There's a lot of famous stories. We also have uh, prophet Elisha in, in the book of 2 Kings took, took, took the mantle after uh, prophet Elijah. So the book of 2 Kings kind of, kind of, kind of carried the storyline uh, with all the kings of Judah and Israel till the captivity. You know, the Israel were taken captive by the Assyrians and the Judah were taken captive by the Babylonians. Now, if you will go to 2 Kings chapter 16, 2 Kings chapter 16. Now, in the book of 2 Kings chapter 16, this is the first time the word Jews is mentioned. The first mention of the word Jews. First, uh, 2 Kings chapter 16, look at verse number 5. 2 Kings 16, verse number 5, the Bible says, Then reason, king of what? Syria, 
and Pekah, son of Ramaliah, king of what? Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war. And they besieged Ahaz, which is the king of Judah, and could not overcome him. So we have the contest of king of Syria and king of Israel go going against Jerusalem, going against Ahaz, the king of Judah, right? Look at verse number 6. At that time, reason king of Syria recovered Elath to Syria and drave the what? The Jews from Elath, and the Syrians came to Elath and dwelt there unto this day. So Ahaz, the king of Judah, sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of king of Syria and out of the hand of king of Israel, which rise up against me. So we have the story of king of Israel and king of Israel. King of Syria, king of Israel, versus the king of Judah, right? And then, and, then, and then the king of Judah, Ahaz, is crying out to the Assyrian to help him out of the king of Syria and the king of Israel, okay? Now, now, now you, may, you may wonder why the Bible does, you know, split the, the word Israel and the Jews. Now, sometimes the Jews is referring to a nationality, but sometimes Jews can also refer to a religion that depends on the context. Now, in this passage, you know, uh, the reason I believe the southern nation are referring to as the Jews is because the capital of the southern kingdom is Jerusalem, right? With Jerusalem, Jews, it, it makes sense because the Jews are fighting against Israel and against Syria, talking about the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Because the capital of the southern kingdom, Judah, is in Jerusalem. That's why the people in Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, is known as the Jews. But sometimes the Jews does refer to as a religion in, the, in a different context. Go to 1 Kings chapter 15. 1 Kings chapter number 15. So we talk about the capital of the southern kingdom. Now let's talk about the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. 1 Kings chapter 15. We'll look at verse number 33. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 33, the Bible says in 1 Kings 15, verse 33, In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Basha, the son of Ahijah, to reign over all Israel. In where? In Tirzah, 20 and 4 years. So, so, so they originally based in Tirzah, right? Now go to chapter 16, verse 23. 1 Kings 16, verse 23, the Bible says in 1 Kings 16, verse 23, in the third and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel. Twelve years, six years reigned he in Tirzah. And he bought the hill, notice this, Samaria of Shemer for two talents of silver, and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shemer, owner of the hill Samaria. Okay, so... So Omri, the king of Israel, they brought a land called Shemer, and Samaria was named after the word Shemer. That, that's why later we, we, we call the children of the northern kingdom as the Samaritans, because the capital is in Samaria. Make sense? Because, you know, they are based off Shemer. The name of the, their capital is Samaria. Now, the problem of the Samaritans about the northern kingdom is they've intermingled more with the heathen nations. In fact, uh, during, during the time of Christ, they were so far removed. We have the story of the woman at the well. You know, you don't have to turn there, but the Bible says the woman at the well told Jesus, our fathers worship in this mountain. So the Samaritans acknowledged their common father, the patriarchs, right? So the woman at the well is talking about uh, the patriarchs have worship here at this mountain, talking about the Mount Gerizim. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. But Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know, ye know not what? We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So Jesus is even telling him, you don't even know what you are worshiping because they are so far removed from the God of the Bible. And, and because the salvation is of the Jews, it's from the line of the kings of Judah. Okay? So here we have the, different, the difference between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Okay? And then we have the first and second chronicles. First and second chronicles. You may, you may wonder, you know, what's the difference between first and second kings and first and second chronicles? 
Now, the first, second chronicles pretty much uh, recap the story, but they focus more on the southern kingdom, the first and second chronicles. Just like the gospels, you know, we have four gospels telling the, telling the story from four different angles. We have first, second chronicles, uh, recap the story, but focusing on the southern kingdoms. Now, the book of first chronicle pretty much had the same storyline as the book of second Samuel. And the book of Second Chronicles have the same time, uh, kind of same timeline between First and Second Kings. So they are kind of a recap of the story, but have but from different angles. Okay, so First Chronicles parallel with Second Samuel, and first, Second Chronicles parallel with First and Second Kings. And then we have the book of Ezra. So the book of Ezra just taught, just told a story that Judah came back from the, from the captivity during the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, and they built a temple. And then we have the book of Nehemiah, they built a wall, okay? And then we have the book of Esther, which happens in the Middle Persian Empire in Shuja, the palace. So pretty much from Genesis to Esther, the Bible is in a perfect chronological order. Does that make sense to you? From Genesis to Esther. And then we enter into a new section called the Poetic Books. We have the Book of Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Okay? Now, the Poetic Books, they don't really contribute to the timeline, but they are full of wise sayings and doctrines. You know? You know, but, but, I, but I do believe the, the Poetic Book is in chronological order in and of itself. Think, just think about that. The Book of Job, I believe, is written during the Book of Genesis. It's one of the oldest books in the Bible. And Psalm, the primary author is David, right? Proverbs, primary author is Solomon. He wrote Ecclesiastes and Son of Solomon. So the book of poetic books in and of, in and of itself is indeed in chron chronological order as well. Um, we have a lot of wise sayings and doctrines from Psalm, Proverbs, even Son of Solomon. A lot of people don't want to read Son of Solomon, but if you really study it, they have a lot of great doctrines. Why? For all scripture is profitable for doctrine. That's why read Sound of Solomon's, all right? Okay. And then we enter into a new section called, called the prophetic book. Go to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Now the prophetic book kind of divide into two sections, the major prophet and the minor prophet. Now the major prophet and the minor prophet they are not called major prophet because they are better. Okay, they are that they are like better in the sense of importance, simply because they are more lengthy. There's more prophecy in the Bible. You know, there are, for example, Isaiah has 66 chapters. Jeremiah have 52, if I remember correctly, uh, some some chapters. So the book of Isaiah, look at uh, chapter one, verse number one. Isaiah chapter one, verse number one. The Bible says, "The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah." And Jerusalem in the days of don't 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 uh, don't don't miss this Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. So Isaiah is prophesying in the reigns of four kings, right? Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, and he prophesied long before Judah went into captivity. Now the next prophet is the prophet Jeremiah. The Bible describing Jeremiah is prophesying during the reigns of Josiah. Jehoiakim and Zedekiah until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So the book of Jeremiah is telling the story he's prophesying leading up to the captivity. And then we have the book of Lamentation is basically Jeremiah lamenting uh, the, the children of Israel uh, being captive. And then we have the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel starts off that uh, talking about Ezekiel was among the captive. So notice this, Isaiah is long before they came and went into captivity. Jeremiah is leading up to the captivity, and Ezekiel is when they are among the captivity, okay? And the book of Daniel is pretty much still among the, cap uh, still among the captivity, but Daniel lived a long life. He's uh, prophesying towards the end of the captivity. So pretty much the major prophet is also in chronological order, right? They, they go long before captivity till towards the end of captivity. And then we have the series of what we call the minor prophet. Go to Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1. It's right after uh, Daniel. Hosea chapter 1. Look at verse number 1. Hosea chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 1, verse number 1, The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea the son of Beri 
don't miss this. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Does that sound familiar? It's the same reign during prophet Isaiah, right? So basically, Hosea is you know contemporary with the prophet Isaiah. So I, uh, the, the minor prophet in and of itself is also in chronological order if you study it. And then we have the, the prophet Joel. The Joel uh, teaches a lot about the day of the Lord, uh, prophesying the end time. And we have the book of Amos preaching during the reign of Uzziah. And we have the book of Jonah. Um, I believe Jonah takes place during the reign of King Amaziah because uh, the name Jonah was man mentioned in Second Kings during the reign of Amaziah, if that's indeed the same Jonah. And Micah was, uh, was preaching during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And Nahum, the book of Nahum, did, uh, kind of described the destruction of Nineveh. Um, and we have the book of Habakkuk prophesying about the Babylonian captivity. Um, and then we have the book of Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, preaching after the captivity. So the, so the major prophet and minor prophet in and of itself is also in chronological order. So the Bible is pretty consistent, you know, just, just the flow of things. Now go to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. So Malachi chapter 3 is the last chapter in the last book of the Old Testament. So right before they enter into the so-called period of silence, the intertestament period, let's, let, let's look, look at what God said in Malachi chapter 3, right before they enter into the intertestament period. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So at the very final chapter of the Old Testament, the prophet, uh, the God, is, is telling uh, Malachi that he will send his messenger and he shall prepare the way of the Lord. He's prophesying the first prophet in the New Testament. He's preaching, uh, foreshadowing John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Go to Malachi chapter 4. Look at verse number 4. Malachi chapter 4, verse number 4. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 4, verse number 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I command unto you him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the very final verses of the last book of the Old Testament, right before they enter into the so-called period of silence, is God telling them to remember the law of Moses, right? Remember the law of Moses. Think about this. What's the foundation of the Old Testament? I believe it's the Torah, right? The first, the law of Moses, the, 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 the Torah, the Pentateuch. So it makes sense, you know, right, right before there's a period of silence, the intertestament period, God told them to remember the law of Moses. And the Bible also tells them in verse number 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, I believe this has a dual fulfillment in that. You know, I, I believe the near future fulfillment is talking about the John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, but I also believe this has the end time uh, application with Elijah being one of the two witnesses before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Obviously, you don't have to believe me, but that's just what I believe. Um, so we have the prophecy about uh, we have the prophecy about uh, Elijah, you know, talking about uh, John the Baptist as well. And then we enter into this period called the Intertestament period, a four hundred years of silence. There may be prophets during that time, but it's not written in the Bible, so we don't really know. But we commonly know as you know the period of silence, four hundred years of silence. And God left them, just remember the law of Moses, and I will send you Elijah, right? I will send you John the Baptist to, to prepare the way of the Lord. They've heard the prophecy of a Savior. They've heard the prophecy of the Messiah to redeem the children of Israel. So, so I wonder, a lot of people, they've been waiting. They've been waiting earnestly for the first coming of Christ. They've been waiting uh, for the Savior, for the Messiah. And... And we are fortunate that the Bible does give us several characters that are waiting in this intertestament period. 
you don't have to turn there, but the Bible refrain, the Bible talks about a, a guy named Simeon. Simeon was an old man. The Bible says uh, he, he was the same man, was just, talking about his righteous and devout. He's, he's, he, he's religious in doing the things of the Lord. He's also waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. So we have an old man who's lived in the intertestament period. He is waiting. He's keeping the law. He's righteous. He did exactly what Malachi said, right? Keep the law of Moses, and I will send you Elijah before the uh, coming of the Lord. He's waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting also for the Savior. We also have a, a widow named Anna. Right? Anna was also an old woman. He lived in the intertestament period as well. The Bible described the describing he departed not from the temple. Right? He did not skip church, if you will, you know, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And and because of their faithfulness, because of their uh, devoutness, they witnessed the fulfillment of the prophecy. Not only John the Baptist, but also the Lord Jesus Christ. So between the first, during the first coming of Christ, Jesus Christ came as a humble servant. Right? We have the so-called period of silence. We have promises given by God. We have, pro we have prophecies waiting to be fulfilled. And then we enter into this New Testament. Let's go back to your table of content. The New Testament. Actually, my bad. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22. So, so the layout of the New Testament is kind of similar than the Old Testament. Think about this. The foundation of the Old Testament is the Torah, right? The first five books of the Bible. What's the foundation of the New Testament? The four Gospels, right? Talking about the foundation, talking about the story, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. He came and He died for our sin and He rose from the dead. And then in the Old Testament, we have the historical book, right? In the New Testament, we have the Acts of the Apostles, telling the story of the uh, early local New Testament churches, right? And then we have the poetic books, which does not contribute to the storyline, but give you a lot of doctrines and teachings. And in the New Testament, we have the epistles, kind of give you a lot of doctrines and teachings from, uh, f from the apostles, mainly from Apostle Paul. And during the epistles, it's, it's divided into three sections. We have uh, the epistle to the, to the churches. We have the pastoral epistle, you know, uh, main, mainly the first, second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And we have the general epistles because there's really no specific audience. Uh, the book of Hebrews, written to all Hebrews, first, second Peter, first, second, uh, first, second, third John, and the book of Jude. And then in the Old Testament, we have the prophetic book, right? And in the New Testament, we have the book of Revelation. So again, it's a very uh, nice parallel, and, and again, it's also in chronological order in and of itself. Now, remember, in the Old Testament, the Bible ends with the book of Malachi, right? Telling to remember the law of Moses and waiting for John the Baptist, waiting for Elijah, things like that. Now, look at Revelation chapter 22, verse number 6. Revelation 22, verse number 6. The last book of the New Testament, the Bible says in Revelation 22, verse number 6, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Verse number 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. See, in Malachi, be, uh, before the first coming, God is told him to remember the law of Moses, right? Same thing with the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ is telling us to keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Why? Because these things which must shortly be done. So we kind of, we are kind of in the same situation. We are sort of in this intertestament period as well. Now, don't, now don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to add upon the word of God. I'm just saying we are just like between Malachi and Matthew. We are just like they are waiting for the first coming. We are waiting for the second coming of Christ. We are right in the middle of the last chapter of the history of the mankind. So 
during the first coming, Jesus Christ came as a humble servant. And in the New Testament, we are waiting for the second coming of Christ, and Jesus Christ will come as a mighty warrior. So there you go. That's the introduction. Let me give you three points very quickly, all right? A very simple three thoughts. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. So thoughts number one. We are looking forward to the second coming of Christ. We are looking forward to the second coming of Christ. Now, just to define the term, when I mean second coming, I'm talking about the rapture. You might think, you might believe second coming is talking about the battle of Armageddon, but it's just different definitions, uh, if you will. If you really want to be technical, that will be the sixth, seventh coming because there will be Old Testament appearance of Christ. And after Jesus Christ resurrected, he came down again. So just the terminology that I use, so, okay? So just for, for the sake of the sermon, when I say second coming, I mean the rapture. You, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So number one, we are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians chapter number four, verse 13. A very famous passage about the rapture. First, first Thessalonians chapter four, verse number 13, the Bible says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds in, in, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We will comfort one another with these words. A very powerful passage. We preach that in funerals that we shouldn't be sorrowing if our loved ones are, are, are trusting in Christ because it, it's just a short farewell, right? We'll see them again in heaven. But notice in verse, uh, chapter number 5, verse number 1, the chapter starts with the word but. Now, I'm not a theologian, but I know but is a conjunction, right? So it's in the same thought of the last passage of chapter number 4. It's talking about the rapture. Notice Chapter 5, verse number 1, the Bible says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Let's continue reading. Let's not take that verse out, out of context. Verse number 3. For when, notice word, the word day. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Notice verse number four, but ye brethren. So the Bible gave you a stark contrast between they and the brethren, right? But ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So if you draw your doctrine from the Left Behind movie, you are wrong, all right? There's no such thing as a secret rapture because we as believers, the Bible says that they should not overtake you as a thief. Why? Verse number five. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunk in the night. But let us who are not of the, who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we don't believe we'll be still on this earth doing the wrath of God. That's why we'll be raptured out before that. Because we, as believers, are the children of light. We, we are watching and be sober that they should not overtake us as a thief. Because we have the hope of salvation. We have the hope of Jesus Christ going to take us out. We are looking forward to the second coming of Christ. Go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I'm almost done. Revelation chapter number 1. So I said, number one, we are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. I said, number two, we are living in the last days. We are living in the last days. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible says, 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants these things, which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John. So the Bible is saying these things in the book of Revelation will be shortly come to pass. Now here's the problem. It's been 2,000 years after that, all right? And also in the New Testament, the Bible is referring to the apostles during their time in the first century as the last days. So by, so by that teaching, we are also living in the last days. You, you say, why? Because anything past the halfway point is the last days. For example, if the earth is 6,000 years, anything past 3,000 years is the last days. If the earth is 7,000 years old, then, a, then anything past 3,500 years is the last days. That makes sense? Anything technically past the halfway point is the last days. So even during the first century, they are living in the last days, and we also are living in the last days. And the Bible have you give you a lot of prophecies about the last days. Talking about in the last days, perilous times shall come, right? Men shall be lovers of their own, own selves, covetous, idolatrous. But the Bible also says in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1, talking about these things must shortly come to pass. Because we, God wants us to know what's going to happen. God wants us to know what's going to happen. We know in the book of Revelation, we have some main events, the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. We have the battle of Armageddon. We have the judgment seat of Christ. We have the millennial reign of Christ. And we have the battle of Gog and Magog, okay? By the way, I believe the battle of Gog and Magog take place after the millennium of Christ, not before the tribulation, because it's just what the Bible says. It's not what left behind teaches, right? Then after the battle of Gog and Magog, we have the great white throne judgment that death and hell will cast into the lake of fire. And then we have the new heaven and new earth will be forever with the Lord. The Bible says these things must shortly come to pass. And I believe personally that Jesus Christ will come in my generation. Because we see with all the technology, all the, all the prophecy it can be literally fulfilled in our lifetime. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse number 2. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 2. Because these things must shortly come to pass, look at verse number 2. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things he saw, blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So here's the Bible is admonishing us. Because the day is near, because the time is at hand, because we are living in the last days, we just need to be faithful, right? Read God's word, hear the words of this prophecy, preach, and keep those things which are written therein. How do you apply that? Read your Bible, go to church, hear, hear the words of God being preached, and keep those things. Just be faithful, like Simeon and Anna in the last intertestament period. Let me give you the third one, the last point, and I'll be done. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll be done, I promise. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. So I say number 1, we are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. I say number 2, we are living in the last days. Number 3, we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have a more sure word of prophecy. 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 16. 2 Peter 1, verse number 16, the Bible says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Here's what Peter is saying. We, we do not follow a made-up story. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's referring to the Mount of Transfiguration. They were eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ, his glorified body, his, even his coming kingdom. Verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory, where when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. He's referring to the Mount of Transfiguration. But I want to notice verse number 19. Verse number 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed. A lot of times we take verse 19 out of context. 
we think, uh, we, we, we just use that verse as teaching you we have a more sure with a prophecy, the Bible is good, okay? But don't miss the context. The context is verse 16 to verse 18, the Mount of Transfiguration. I want you to notice the context. Peter is eyewitnesses of the glorified Christ, his coming kingdom. He's literally being with Christ face to face. And then he said in verse number 19, the word of God is more sure than my experiences. He's in contact with the Mount of Transfiguration. This is powerful. Even though he has seen Christ face to face, yet he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. So here, to our New Testament believers, we have everything we need. Even Apostle Peter, with this Christ face to face, acknowledged the word of God is more sure than my personal experiences. Even though the great kings in the Old Testament, King David, King Solomon, they don't have the whole word of God. Even Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, even, our, even the patriarchs does not have the whole counsel of God. And here, Apostle Peter says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Don't miss this. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. I don't have time to delve into this, but I, the day star is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you do some study with it, talking about the morning star, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible is literally saying, despite of what you've experienced, despite your personal tragedy, struggles, we have the more sure word of prophecy. The Bible is teaching you the word of God is bigger than your problems. The word of God is bigger than your struggles, is bigger than your experiences. If your experience, if your personal experience, is in country with the word of God, you are wrong. It doesn't matter what you think. It depends on what God thinks. So the last point I'm simply making is we have a more sure word of prophecy. In this intertestament period, the Bible admonished us in the book of Revelation to take heed on those things, for the time is at hand. The Bible tells us to read, to hear, and to take heed upon the word of God. In the, at the end of the day, the best thing we can do to wait for the second coming of Christ is simply be faithful, keep everything in this book, and read it and meditate it, because the Word of God is going to tell you the will of God, the promise of God, and it will tell you, you will know exactly what's going to happen before His coming. So, so we will be actively watching, looking for the blessed hope, right, and the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And before that, just be faithful. Like Anna and Simeon, be just, be devout, and serve God. Don't quit church. You know, have, an, have an, as many people saved as possible. Be the fishers of men. But more importantly, we have the more sure word of prophecy. And I hope uh, this sermon tonight, I give you the overview of the whole Bible. I mean, I, I, mean, I hope you learn something from it. I, I, hope, I hope that encourage you to read the Bible more. You know, it's not that complicated. Obviously, there, obviously, obviously there's some dark sayings, some deep doctrines in the Bible. But if, but if you just be faithful, you know, if, if you just be faithful, God will bless you. So, so let's do this. Let, let's actually close the sermon with a song. Uh, Miss Bethany, if you can come forward. Uh, let's go to page 840, song number 840. Let's close the sermon with a song, and I'll close with a prayer.